Hi everyone. So in this video, we're gonna to continue to talk about using partial fractions to evaluate integrals. So we're gonna see a couple of different situations that can arise um, that are different from the previous video. And um, yeah, the main thing we're gonna be doing in this video is just a bunch of examples. So we're gonna do, I think, four different examples. Um, this video will probably be kind of long, and a lot of that is because you know the, the actual algebra and computation takes a while on these. So just wanna give you a heads up that I think this is a, a great video for you to, you know, once you get a hang of what's going on, pause and try to do things yourself um, so that you know, you're not just sitting there watching like an hour of me doing algebra on the screen. Okay, so I wanna jump right into an example that we'll see, you know, immediately we'll bring up something that is different from in the last video. So let's say that we wanted to evaluate the integral um, 10x squared minus 3x plus 5 divided by x cubed plus x dx. So what we saw in the last video is that when you have a rational function like this, so a function where you have a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the denominator, um, the first thing we wanna do is in order to do this partial fraction decomposition, we wanna factor the denominator. So we're gonna take this function and factor the denominator to figure out what are gonna be the building blocks of our partial fraction decomposition. So what can we factor out from both of these terms in the denominator? Well, we can factor out x. And so we're left with x times x squared plus one. And that's actually as far as we can go. There's no way to, unless you incorporate um, imaginary numbers, there's no way to factor x squared plus one. And so x squared plus one is what's called an irreducible quadratic. So irreducible just basically means that it can't be broken down any further, right? It can't be factored. So it's called an irreducible quadratic. And in this um, class, the, the you know, irreducible quadratic refers to any quadratic that cannot be factored, but the ones that we'll be dealing with in this class are mostly gonna look like this, x squared plus a number. Okay, so that means that our two denominators are gonna be x and um, x squared plus one. But there's something a little bit different in this case. So in the last video, the numerators of these partial fractions were always just a number, right? A, B, C, D, it always just represented a single number. And when you have a denominator that is an irreducible quadratic, you actually can't just make the numerator a number. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna call this numerator A, and that's just a number, but the numerator for the irreducible quadratic, we have to write that as BX plus C. So it's a linear numerator. So I don't have a great explanation for why this is. You know, I actually thought about this a lot and thought about you know, what's the best way to explain it, and there, I just really couldn't come up with a good explanation that doesn't get way too complicated. So what I would say is, is if you are like not totally convinced, if you're like, I don't get why we would need to put bx plus c, try yourself to do this decomposition. Try it with a over x plus b over x squared plus one. And what you should see is that it just doesn't work. Things are gonna fall apart. You're not gonna be able to find a solution. So basically the, the idea is that, you know, there might be some fractions, and we'll actually see an example later in the video, where you don't need this bx part, but there are some where you do, and we'll see that this one is, is one where you do. So basically it's just the idea is to, um, you know, in order to be absolutely certain that you can take any fraction and break it into these smaller fractions, this is the rule that you have to use. So we have to do, um, and I'll write this down in a little bit later as like a general rule, but anytime you have an irreducible quadratic in the denominator, your numerator is gonna be linear. So a number times x plus another number. All right, so from here, it's gonna go just like the, uh, the other ones did. So we're gonna make a common denominator so that means that for the first fraction, we wanna multiply it by x squared plus one over x squared plus one. And then for the second one, we just wanna multiply it by x over x. Okay. 
Okay, so that's gonna give us um, ax squared plus a, and then I'm just gonna rewrite this all as one fraction. So in the last video, I kind of left it as two separate fractions. You can do that, you can put them together. It doesn't really matter, because right, they have the same denominator now. So I'll just put it as one big fraction just to give us a little less to write down. So ax squared plus a plus, and then we get um, bx squared plus cx. And then our denominator is um, x times x squared plus one. Okay, so from here, this is gonna be just like the other examples we did. So I would encourage you to pause the video and try this yourself. Um, it's really, really the only thing that was new here was this new um, numerator that went with the irreducible quadratic. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna take these two numerators and set them equal to each other because we wanna make sure that the new fraction that we built is the same as the original fraction we started with. So we have ax squared plus a plus bx squared plus cx. And we want that to be equal to 10x squared minus 3x plus 5. So like we did in the last video, we're going to go through and um, like match up the left and right hand side. So for example, we have ax squared plus bx squared. Together, those have to give us 10x squared. And so that tells us that a plus b is equal to 10. And then if we look for any term that has an x in it, well, there's actually only one, right? So cx is, is exactly where this negative 3x has to come from. And so we can conclude that c is equal to negative 3. And then next we have our constant term. And so the only constant we have is just a. And so that tells us that a has to be equal to 5. So this is kind of a nice one in terms of the algebra, because now we already know that a is equal to 5 and c is equal to negative 3. And so now we can just take this equation and plug in um, 5 for a. So 5 plus b is equal to 10. And so it turns out that b is also equal to 5. All right, so now we have to go back and you know check in with what, well actually first let, let's start to write down this integral. So let's write down our original integral and then we'll write it split up. And when we write it split up, we have to look and remind ourselves you know what, what do a, b, and c actually represent here? So this was what we started with. And we now figured out that we can rewrite this as the integral of, so a was the coefficient of x. So we have um, five over x. And then cx plus, or bx plus c, rather, this was the numerator for x squared plus 1, right? So we want to make sure that we put b as a coefficient for x. So we have 5x, and then c was negative 3, and that's over x squared plus 1. Okay, so now like we did in the last video, we want to split this up into two integrals, and we'll actually see that this one's going to split into three integrals. So, but let's let's start by breaking it into two. So we're going to have um, five times the integral of one over x. Then we're going to have um, the integral of five x minus three over x squared plus one. So we know how to integrate this first one, right? We know how to integrate one over x. What about five x minus three over x squared plus one? Well, that doesn't look so friendly to integrate. However, remember that anytime you have a fraction, you know, with multiple terms in the numerator, you can split it up. So it's, it's not the same as doing partial fractions, right? It's a different kind of method of splitting up that isn't gonna always be helpful, but in this case it is. So in this case, we can split this um, second fraction up into um, so we have the integral of, and let's actually pull that 5 out. So it'll be 5 times the integral of x over x squared plus 1. And then the last part is going to be minus 3 times the integral of 1 over x squared plus 1. So why is this you know, going to work? Well, basically, we know that if you have 1 over x squared plus 1, that's just inverse tangent. So that one's all set. And then what about this one? Well, this is going to be a substitution. If we let u equal x squared plus 1, then du is 2x dx, so we'll be able to get rid of that x. So let's do that. Let's let u equal x squared plus 1. And so du 
is going to be um, 2x dx. And so that means that du over 2x is going to be equal to dx. So what's that going to look like when we actually do that substitution? So let me just write down this, these first, this first integral. So here we're just going to have, I'm going to actually go ahead and I'm not going to write all of this stuff down because I think at this point, you know, we've done a lot of substitution. So I think hopefully you've kind of gotten a hang of it and maybe don't have to write every single detail down. So notice that if we were to put in this expression here for dx, the x would cancel out in the numerator and we would be left with this extra two in the denominator. So I'm just going to pull that one half, that two out from the denominator as a one half and now we're left with one over u du. And then here we get minus three times, that one's gonna be inverse tangent. Okay, so what do we get now? So now we have um, five times ln of absolute value of x. Here we're gonna have five halves times ln of absolute value of u. And he, then here we're gonna have minus three times inverse tangent of x plus c. And then the last thing to do is just to put back in what u was. So five times ln of absolute value of x plus five halves times ln of absolute value of x squared plus one minus three times inverse tangent of x plus c. So what we'll see in this video is that basically these are exactly the kind of things that are going to come up when we when you use partial fractions. So sometimes you'll get ln of just you know x or of x plus one or something like that. Sometimes you'll have a substitution where you end up with ln of x squared plus something, and then sometimes we'll have an inverse tangent. Um, those are really going to be kind of the the building blocks of our uh, our answers here. So I want to do another example, and then after we do this next example, then we'll write down some kind of general rules, and then we'll see um, two more examples which both bring up something new. So the maybe just to quickly mention this, in the later examples in the video, we're going to be doing um, long or polynomial long division. So just to give you a heads up on that. Okay, so what's our next example? Um, let's do the following. So let's do the integral of x cubed plus x squared plus 5x minus 15 and this is being divided by um, x to the fourth plus 5x squared. Okay so again we want to start by factoring. So we have x cubed plus x squared plus 5x minus 15 um, and so what can we factor here? We can factor out an x squared, right? So we have x squared times x squared plus five. So once again, we have another irreducible quadratic, right? x squared plus five cannot be factored with real numbers. And so our denominators, so let's get to the irreducible quadratic in a second, but, but our denominators, let's first look at the x squared. So you have to remember something from the last video. So in the last video, we saw that if you have something um, something like a whole thing squared, like x squared or you know x plus one squared or anything that the whole thing is getting squared. In those cases, you have to uh, include a fraction for each kind of copy, uh, each power of that quantity. And so in this case, that means that we need to include a fraction with a denominator of x and then another one with a denominator of x squared. If it was x cubed, then we would need x and an x squared and an x cubed. If it was x to the fourth, we would need x, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth. Because we're just, basically think of this as you're trying to cover all your bases for what could possibly have been the building blocks of this fraction. So as we saw in the last video, um, when you have these linear or even a linear quantity raised to a power as your denominator, your numerator is just a number. So I think it's, it's easy to mix this up it's only when you have an irreducible quadratic like this that your numerator becomes a, a linear function. Um, when you have just something squared, the numerator is just a number. And again, we'll write this down as a rule in a little bit. And so our last fraction is x squared plus five, and here the numerator is gonna be cx plus d. 
Okay, so we want to make a common denominator. So let's think about you know, what, what is it that we are missing from each of these. So this one, in order to get, you know, comparing, like looking at everything else we have here, what is this one missing? It's missing an x and an x squared plus 5. So we're going to multiply this by x times x squared plus 5 over x times x squared plus 5. And then the next fraction, b over x squared, well, that's just missing an x squared plus 5. And then this third fraction, what's missing from this denominator that the other ones have, that would just be um, an x squared. Okay, so now let's um, make our new numerator. And actually, let me write out what, what this is. So x times x squared plus 5, that's going to be x cubed plus 5x, just to make it a little easier to do that um, multiplication. So here we're going to get ax cubed plus 5a times x. And then for the next part, again, I'm just going to make it all as one fraction, um, plus bx squared plus um, 5b plus cx cubed plus dx squared. Um, and that's all over our new numerator or denominator, which is x squared times x squared plus 5. OK, so now we just set that equal to our original numerator. So all this stuff here, this, in order to be equivalent, needs to equal our original numerator. So we have ax cubed plus 5ax plus bx squared plus 5b plus cx cubed plus dx squared. All of that has to equal x cubed plus x squared plus 5x minus 15. Okay, so again, let's go through and just pair things up. So let's look for all the x cubes. We have an ax cubed, we have a cx cubed, and that's it. And so that tells us that a plus c has to be equal to 1. And then if we look through for x squareds, we have a bx squared, we have a dx squared, and we have a 1x squared on the other side. So that means that the coefficients b and d together, those must add up to 1. And then if we look for our x's, we have a 5ax, and that's it. So 5ax has to equal 5x, and so that means that um, 5a has to equal 5. And then we have one last thing, which is the, the b. So b is um, our constant term, 5 times b, and that's supposed to equal negative 15. OK, so a couple of these we can write off the bat, you know, find an answer. So this one tells us that a is equal to 1. This one tells us that b is equal to negative 3. And then using those pieces of information, now we can find these. So a plus c is supposed to equal 1. So that means that 1 plus c has to equal 1. And so that means that c is equal to 0. And that's OK to get 0. Well, I'll, I'll show you what that means in just a second. And then here we end up with, um, so b is equal to negative 3. So negative 3 plus d is equal to 1. And so that tells us that d is equal to 4. So what does it mean to get c is equal to 0? Well, let's go back and look at what c actually represented in this question. So c was this number here. And so what that basically means is that we don't have an x in, in the numerator of that fraction. We just have a number over x squared plus 5. And so I mentioned earlier, that can happen. It's just that you don't know until you actually go through this process whether there's an x in the numerator or not. So that's why you have to at least allow the possibility. OK, so let's rewrite our integral now. So we have the integral of, so the original one was x cubed plus x squared plus 5x minus 15, all divided by x to the fourth 
plus 5x squared. So what we just figured out is that this can be written as the integral of so first we have one over, and that was the coefficient for x, that's what a was, and then we have negative three was the numerator for x squared. And then we already said how c is zero, so that means that the um, numerator for x squared plus five is just gonna be four. So we have four over x squared plus five. Okay. So um, what is this gonna give us? Well, let's, let's break this up into a few separate integrals. So we have the integral of one dx minus three times the integral of one over x squared dx. And then we have plus, we can pull that four out and we have one over x squared plus five. So we know how to do those first two. Um, this last one, we don't know yet, right? We know what to do if it's x squared plus one, but what can we do if it's x squared plus five? So it turns out that there's actually a rule that you can just kind of use. This is something that um, appears on a lot of integral tables, and I'll add it to our, our integral list like for tests and stuff like that. Um, so this integral here, anytime you have an integral of the form um, one over x squared plus a squared, so I know that five is not an integer squared, but we can still think of it as a squared by thinking of a as being the square root of five, right? So if, if a is the square root of five, then we can see this integral as being in that form. So anytime you have an integral in that form, basically this comes from substitution. So if you were to do, if you basically were to take this integrand and factor out um, an a squared from both of the bottom terms, and then from there, if you did a u substitution where you let u equal x over a, you would get the following. So the antiderivative is going to be um, one over a times inverse tangent of x over a plus c. So that's just something that you can use in the future. You know, we don't need to, you don't need to actually do the substitution, but if you're curious, it comes from a substitution. All right, so now we can go through and actually evaluate these. So the first one is ln of absolute value of x. The next one is negative three times, so remember uh, one over x squared is the same as x to the negative two, so we saw this in the last video. The antiderivative of x to the negative two is negative one times x to the negative one. And then here we have four times what we just wrote down over here. So in this case, as we said, because we have x squared plus five, a is actually equal to the square root of five. So we have four times one over the square root of five times inverse tangent of x over the square root of five plus c. So another way of writing this would be ln of absolute value of x. So this becomes plus three over x. x to the negative one is just one over x. And then here we have four over the square root of five times inverse tangent of x over the square root of five plus c. And by the way, I don't know if I've ever mentioned this, but in this class, I'm really not worried about rationalizing denominators. Just leave them. It's not, you know, rationalizing denominators is basically like an artifact of a time before calculators. So it's it's just not really something that's super important. And um, yeah, it's, it's a good thing to know how to do, but I don't think it's something you need to do on, on every problem. Okay, so I want to, before we get to some examples where we need to use long division, I want to just kind of summarize what we've learned so far. So I'm going to leave um, a little bit of space at the top for us to write down a step related to long division, but let me just kind of label this. So this is going to be the, the basically like the steps for partial fraction decomposition. So like I said, first step, let's let's leave a space there. We'll add that in. Hopefully I'll leave enough space. So second step is going to be um, basically where, where we've started on these other ones. So the first thing we want to do is factor the denominator.
then after that, basically, this is where kind of the important stuff comes in. So for every distinct linear factor, so when I say a distinct linear factor, I mean something like you have just x minus 1 as one of the factors in the denominator, or you have x plus 2, but you don't have one of those things squared. You have it once. So that's what the word distinct means. It means it's not repeated. So maybe I'll even write that in here. So distinct here means not repeated. Actually, let me, sorry, let me just scooch this here so that it's not taking up too much space. So for every distinct linear factor, um, ax plus b, you want to include a fraction that looks like this, a over ax plus b. So that's what we've seen, right? That's like um, what we did basically in, in the first few examples on the last video. Um, for every repeated linear factor, So that would be something where you have something linear, so ax plus b, but raised to some power. Then you need to include um, not just you know, one of them, you basically need to do a1 over ax plus b plus a2 over ax plus b squared plus dot, 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 all the way up to, you know, however many um, powers you have. And as I mentioned, you know, we're really only going to be doing ones where there are two, but just, just so that you know, like the general process. And, you know, you don't have to call them A1, A2, you can call them A, B, C. I'm just saying that because, you know, I don't know how many powers we have, right? N is, N can be any number. And so I'm using A2, A1, A2, AN just because I don't know where to stop, right, with A, B, C. Okay, so those were the, the two cases we saw in the previous video. The third case is for every irreducible quadratic factor, um, we want to include, oh sorry, let me write something else here. So for every irreducible quadratic factor, x squared plus b, what we want to include is something that looks like this, ax plus b over x squared plus b. And there's not meant to be any relationship, by the way, between the upper and lower cases a and b's. They're just, you know, just happen to be using the same letter. So that's what we have for, for kind of the main step of, of setting this up. And then the next thing is basically to make a common denominator and add, oops, and add the fractions. Um, and then next step is to uh, equate, equate meaning set equal, the new and um, original numerators and solve for the unknowns. And that's basically it. So like I said, we'll come back and add a first step that will happen in some of them um, in a moment. Okay, so let's jump into another example. So let's say that we wanted to evaluate now the integral of x to the fourth minus 2x squared um, plus 4x plus 1, all divided by x cubed minus x squared minus x plus 1. Okay, so what's different about this one compared to all the other ones we've done? So, you know, you might not notice this right off the bat, but, but the difference is that in this case, the numerator has a higher degree than the denominator right? Like we have four on the top, three on the bottom. And so 
it turns out that the process that we have learned for partial fraction um, decomposition only works when the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. So in situations like this, where the degree of the, the numerator is bigger, we have to start by using polynomial long division, and that will kind of allow us to um, get the ball rolling on, on breaking down this fraction, and we'll be left with another fraction that we will be able to do pol or, sorry, partial fraction decomposition with. So I mentioned this at the end of the last video, but um, you know I'm not gonna like teach you polynomial long division from scratch in this video because it's really something that you're supposed to have learned before this class. Um, so if, if you haven't seen it ever before, or if you know it, it feels like a little rusty, it's something that you might wanna go watch some extra videos and, and remind yourself how it works. Um, you should have learned it if you took math at North, you should have learned it in, um, both Math 98, actually, and Math 141. Um, so polynomial long division, by the way, one thing that you know might help kind of get the ball rolling of rem remembering how it works, it helps if you remember how to do regular long division. So if you know how to you know maybe take something that looks like this and do long division, it's basically going to be a very similar procedure, but with polynomials instead of with, with integers. Okay, so how does this work? Well, we want to take the numerator and put that on the inside because that's what we're, you know, we're going to do that divided by the denominator. One thing that's really important is that if your polynomial is missing a term, so notice that there is no x cubed term, you want to actually kind of put in a placeholder. So I'm going to write zero x cubed. And that will just kind of make sure that we're, we're lining everything up correctly and subtracting everything from the right thing. We'll see why that is in a moment. Okay, so now we're gonna take this and we're going to divide it by um, the denominator. So that's x cubed minus x squared minus x plus one. So how does this process work? Well, basically you're always focusing just on the leading term. So we're looking at x to the fourth and x cubed and we're dividing x to the fourth by x cubed. So what is x to the fourth divided by x cubed? It's x. And once we get a result in, you know, for that division, what we do is we take that result, so we take x, and we multiply it with this here. And we write it down below. So let's do that. Let's multiply x with that whole, this thing here, and we'll write it below. So we end up with x to the fourth um, minus x cubed plus x squared um, plus x. Okay, so next step we're gonna do is we're gonna take this whole thing here and we're gonna subtract it. And so there's a couple different ways to do it. You can either go in and flip the signs of every term or you can put a negative sign outside parentheses, but you just wanna make sure that you actually go in and distribute this negative sign to subtract it from what's above. So the, the x to the fourth is gonna cancel out with x to the fourth, that should always happen. You should always get a zero here because we basically picked this x so that x times x cubed would give us x to the fourth. So you really should get a zero in that first part or else you did something wrong. And so here we get negative x cubed, or sorry, positive x cubed because we have a negative times a negative, so we're distributing that negative sign in. Then we get negative x squared, we add that to the negative 2x squared above, and so that's negative 3x squared. And then finally we have minus x, and that was um, with the 4x above, so that's going to be plus 3x, and then we can bring down this plus 1 as well. Okay, so that's the, the first step. And, and we'll see that in, in these examples, there's not going to be that many steps. So, so the next step is now whatever result we got here, now we're going to repeat the process, but instead, so in the first step, we divided x cubed into x to the fourth. In this step, we're going to be dividing x cubed into x cubed. So you're always, again, going to that leading term. So how many times does x cubed go into x cubed? Well, that would just be 1. And so now we take 1 and we multiply it with this whole thing and write it below. So that's just going to be x cubed minus x squared minus x plus 1. And then we're going to take that whole thing and subtract it. 
so minus all of this, and then we write down our results below. So when we subtract, we end up with um, zero in the first part, and that that's, should happen. And then we have plus, and so this ends up being negative 2x squared, because here this combines to be plus, negative 3x squared plus x squared is negative 2x squared. And then we have, again, this becomes a plus, and so we have plus 4x. And then we have minus 1, so that becomes 0. Okay, so what does this tell us? Well, actually, maybe let me say one more thing, which is that you want to continue this process until you can't divide anymore. So remember, we started by taking x cubed and dividing it into x to the fourth. Then we divided x cubed into x cubed. The next step would be to divide x cubed into x squared. But that's not going to work, right? We're always looking, you always want to be dividing you want to make sure the, the power of what you're dividing into is bigger than what you're dividing by or equal. So as soon as you get a power that is lower than what you're dividing by, that means that you're actually done with the process. So how should we interpret our answer? Basically what this told us is that you know we had we started with this. We started with x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 4x plus 1 and we are dividing that by um, x cubed minus x squared minus x plus one. And so what did we get as an answer? Well, that's what's written at the top, right? We got x plus one. And then the remaining part is our remainder. And so what do we do with the remainder? Well, we put it over the thing we're dividing by. So we can write this as plus negative two x squared plus four x divided by x cubed minus x minus x, or minus x squared minus x plus one. So why do you do this step? Well, I would encourage you to go back to an example with numbers and then think about it that way. So maybe just to give a quick example, like a simple example, let's say you do 10 divided by three. So 10 divided by three is gonna be three with a remainder of one. So what's another way of saying that? So if 10 divided by three is equal to three with a remainder of one, that remainder of one really represents one third, right? So 10 thirds is the same as three plus one third. And so it's the same exact idea. Okay, so why do we do this? Well, now when we go to do our integral, you know, this part we know how to integrate, right? That's, that's a polynomial, that's easy to integrate. And then this part, now we have something where we can use partial fractions. So why is this now something where we can use partial fractions? Well, because the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. So now we're gonna go through the process of doing partial fractions with this, um, with this example. You know, we'll ignore the x plus one basically and kind of just come back to that at the end. So we have negative two x squared um, plus four x divided by x cubed minus x squared minus x plus one. So this is kind of a, a tricky example for factoring. Um, and I, I wouldn't worry too, too much about being able to factor something like this. You know, I would probably not give you something like this that you would factor by hand, like on a test or anything. But the method that you can use on this is something that's called factoring by grouping. So I'll just show that to you really quickly. But again, I wouldn't worry too much about it. So factoring by grouping is basically taking these terms and kind of grouping them together. So if we look at x cubed minus x squared, and then separately look at negative x plus one. And so for each of those two groups, we see what can we factor out from them. So for these two, we can factor out an x squared, and we would be left with x minus one. So that's these two. And then what about these two? Well, if we factor out an, a negative x, or sorry, a negative one, my bad, from both of those, we end up with x minus one, right? If you factor out negative one from both of those, you have negative one times x minus one. And so then we can put these two together. So now we have x squared minus one times x minus one. So again, I won't really ask you to do something like that. I think on your homework, actually a lot of them come already factored, um, but it's kind of a cool trick to know how to do. So the denominator we now know is x squared minus one times x minus one. 
And then how can you factor x squared minus one? Well, that's a, a difference of squares, right? So we can rewrite that as x plus one times x minus one. So altogether we'll have x plus one times x minus one times x minus one. So what is this gonna look like? Well, we're gonna have um, three fractions, right? And so each of them for the first one is just gonna be a over x plus one. And then the second one is gonna be b over x minus one. And then the third one is gonna be c over x minus one squared. So now let's make a common denominator. So we're gonna take the first one and multiply it by x minus one squared over x minus one squared. Then we're gonna take the next one and multiply it by, so what's missing from this one? We need another x minus one, but we also need the x plus one. So it's gonna be x minus one times x plus one. And then the third fraction, c over x minus one squared, that's just missing an x plus one over an x plus one. Okay, so what's this gonna look like all together? Sorry, my screen is a little stuck. So we're gonna end up with, um, let's actually write out what these are multiplied out. So this first one is x squared minus two x plus one. Um, and then the second one is uh, x squared minus one. And then, yeah, that's all we need. So this is gonna give us ax squared minus 2ax plus a plus bx squared minus b plus cx plus c all over our new common denominator of x plus one times x minus one squared. And so again, we compare our, um, our numerator with the original numerator and make sure it's not, we're not comparing it with the very, very original numerator, right? We're just focusing on the part that we've been doing partial fractions on. So that means that we're gonna have um, ax squared minus two ax plus a plus bx squared minus b plus cx plus c. That should be equal to um, negative two x squared plus four x. So this is kind of an interesting one because notice that the right-hand side does not have any constant term, and so that tells us actually that the constants on the left-hand side are gonna add up to zero. Okay, so let's go through again. So we have um, ax squared, we have bx squared, so that means that a plus b, that should be equal to negative two because we have negative two x squared. Additionally, we have um, negative two, oops, wrong color negative two ax, and then we have cx, and together those need to equal four. So we have negative two a plus c, that should equal four. And then additionally, we have a minus b plus c, and notice that there's no constant term, so that just means that a minus b plus c is equal to zero. So this is a slightly trickier one to solve because we don't have, you know, usually in most of these examples, we've immediately been able to tell what one of our things is. Um, so there, there's a variety of ways that we can do this, but basically we wanna kind of get it to the point where it's just a system of two equations in two variables. And so there's a few ways we could do that, but one thing we could do is we could solve this top equation for either A or B. Let's, let's solve it for B. And then we can put that into this bottom equation, and then that will give us two equations that are only in terms of A and C. So if we take this top equation and we solve it for B, we get B is equal to A minus two. And so that tells us that this one we can rewrite it as a minus a minus two plus c is equal to zero. 
And so now we can, now we have a system of two equations and two variables because we also have this one that is in terms of a and c. But notice something actually interesting comes, uh, happens in this one. If you actually add this stuff together, you have a minus a plus two plus c is equal to zero. And so the a's cancel out. And so we can just see that c is actually equal to negative two. And then we can plug that into this one and figure out what, um, what a is. So now we have negative two a plus um, negative two is equal to four. And so that tells us that negative two a is equal to six. And so a is equal to negative three. And then we know that b is supposed to be equal to um, Sorry, if hopefully these arrows don't get too confusing. B is supposed to be equal to A minus two. So that tells us that B is equal to negative five. Okay, this is definitely a long example, so thank you for bearing with it. Um, so let's now go back and, and see how we can put all of this together. So we just figured out how to decompose not what we started with, but this kind of other fraction that we got along the way. So what was this other fraction? Remember, it was the remainder from when we did our long division. And so really, if we go back to our original integral, we also need to include this x plus one. So all together, we're gonna have, so original integral was um, x to the fourth minus two x squared plus 4x plus 1 divided by x cubed minus x squared minus x plus 1. So we figured out that that could be written as the integral of x plus 1. So that was that first part from the long division. And then we have the partial fraction decomposition. So we have negative 3. So that was the numerator for, if we go back and look, negative 3 was the numerator for x plus 1. So we have negative three over x plus one. Then we have b is negative five, and so that was the numerator for x minus one. And then our final is um, c, that was negative two, and that was the numerator for x minus one squared. Okay, we're almost done. So now we have the integral of x plus one, so that one we can do just using kind of regular integration rules. And then we have um, negative three times the integral of one over x plus one. And then we have negative five times the integral of one over x minus one. And then we have minus two times the integral of one over x minus one squared. Okay, so putting this all together, what do we get? Well, for the first part, we get um, x squared over two plus x. Then for the next part, we have minus three times ln of absolute value of x plus one. So that's the type that we saw in the last video. Then we have minus five times ln of absolute value of x minus one. And then this last part, we also saw ones like this in the last video. Basically, it's a substitution, but it's one that you don't really have to write down in the same way that, you know, one over x minus one, that's technically a substitution. So this is the same thing as x minus one to the negative two. So we can rewrite this as negative two times negative one, x minus one to the negative one. And then we have plus c. So putting this all together, that's x squared over two plus x minus three times ln of absolute value of x plus one, minus five times ln of absolute value of x minus one. And then this here can be written as plus two over x minus one. And then we have plus c. So I just want to add to our now that, you know, that list of, of how do we actually approach these questions. There's, there's one thing that we have to add at the top which is that um, if the degree of the numerator 
is less than the degree of the denominator Well, then you can proceed to step two. But if the degree of the numerator is um, greater than or even equal to of the um, denominator, what you want to do is perform polynomial long division. And then what we saw is that what's the reason behind performing polynomial long division? It's basically to give you this remainder that that's what you can focus on for doing your um, partial fractions. Okay, I wanna look at one more example. I think maybe we won't finish it off completely, um, just because I think by now you probably have the hang of, of kind of the, the second part of this. But I just wanted to show you one other example of polynomial long division that is just a little bit different. So let's say that we now are trying to integrate x squared minus three x minus two over x squared minus five x plus six. So what's different about this one? Well, this is one where the degree of the numerator and the denominator are actually the same. And so I just wanted to quickly show you how one like this goes. It's really the same thing. It just maybe seems a little weird, but, but it's fine. Basically, we just do exactly what we did in the last example. And we take the numerator and we divide it by the denominator. And so this time, when we do our division, you know, we're seeing how many times does x squared go into x squared. And in this case, the answer is just 1. And so then we go and we do our multiplication. So we get x squared minus 5x plus 6. And we take this whole thing and we subtract it. And so when we subtract, we end up with 0. And then this becomes a plus, so this is 2x plus 2x. And then we have minus 6, so this is going to be minus 8. And that's it. That's as far as we can go. Because we get a remainder that is, or what, what we're left with at the bottom, we cannot divide x squared into that anymore. So in this case, what we can do is we can say that our original fraction, so x squared minus 3x minus 2, over x squared minus 5x plus 6 is going to be equal to just 1 plus 2x minus 8 over x squared um, minus 5x plus 6. And then what would you do? You would perform um, partial fraction decomposition on this part. And you know, that's gonna go a lot like the other example, so I'm not gonna go over that. I think we've, we've spent enough time in this video. All right, so that is it for this video. Um, and the next video we're actually going to be doing kind of like review. So the next section in the book is actually, um, it's basically intended for you to kind of look back at all the different methods of integration we've learned and talk about how you can determine when to use which one. So, you know, next video I think will be kind of nice because it will allow you to kind of reflect back and, you know, without learning any new material, just sort of um, see how everything fits together. So I will see you then.